Hello and welcome to everyone. I would like to warmly welcome you all on behalf of the Berko Foundation and the Political Development Forum Yemen to our event today. It's great to see so many uh, colleagues and friends um, joining for, for our event from Yemen and internationally. My name is uh, Sonia Neuweiler. I'm a senior advisor with the Berko Foundation and together with my colleague Nadia Kaukabani, we will be facilitating today's event. Thanks again for joining uh, for our birthday panel. There is an Arabic and an English uh, language channel available, so you can choose the, the channels with the globe icon in the, in the Zoom bar, which is on the lower end of, of your screen. And you can also use the chat function if you need any support. So looking back at 10 years of dialogue work in Yemen, and looking forward, that's what we would like to do with you together today. 10 years ago, Yemen was at a, at a very crit critical juncture. Um, after Yemen had reached the brink of civil war in 2011, the main Yemeni parties, of course, with the exception of Ansar Allah and the Southern Movement, had agreed to a peace agreement that was brokered by the Gulf Cooperation Council with UN and international support at the time. This agreement had defined the steps for a peaceful handover of power, it had outlined the transition plan, and at its core, it had the implementation of a comprehensive Yemeni National Dialogue Conference. So taking us back these years, there was a lot of hope at the time, but of course also things have dramatically changed since then. And at the moment, it's a critical juncture again in, in some ways, and negotiations led by the UN are ongoing about the third extension of a truce between the Yemeni parties, which hopefully would allow for easing the humanitarian situation, providing some breathing space to the population, and also hopefully eventually lead to the reactivation of a political process and of political negotiations between the parties for comprehensive settlement. So Berkhoff and PDF have jointly started their work 10 years ago. And we initially started with a high level meeting of representatives of all Yemeni parties and components in Potsdam. And after more of 10 years of dialogue support work in Yemen, we would like to jointly reflect today about some of the achievements, some of the challenges, and also some of the lessons learned throughout this, this work. We're very happy to have Philip Holzapfel joining us today. In 2012, Philip served as the deputy head of mission of the German embassy in Sana'a. And since then, he has been the head of the Maghreb section. He was a diplomat for the EU delegation in Morocco and he had many, many other stations. In some ways, Philip, our, our work has, has started also with you and also the long-term support from the German Federal Foreign Office has in some ways started with you. So it's, it's great to, to have you with us today. And we would like to ask you to start some Start us off with some reflections of your time uh, in Sana'a at the time in 2012, how you perceived the atmosphere back then, and also if you could give us some of your personal reflections and lessons learned that the process in Yemen might also hold for other countries. You have been also th um, deployed throughout the region afterwards, have seen many processes, so it would be great if you could share some of your re reflections from Yemen also for the region. Thanks a lot and welcome again. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Sonia, and uh, thank you to the Berka Foundation and uh, the Political Dialogue Forum, and happy birthday to 10 years. Um, uh, Sonia already explained it, I'm obviously not here in my current official capacity um, as a uh, chargé in, in, in Baghdad, in Iraq, um, more rather as an alumnus of the first hour, if you will, um, and it's a, it's, it's a great honored to be here, but also a great pleasure not only to see uh, German friends again, Walakin um, uh, Aydam, Sharaf wa Saada Kabira. But I'm also happy and very honored to see our Yemeni friends who I have not seen in a very long time, in around nine or ten years. And so I welcome you, I welcome Ali Said Hassan and the others. Yemen is a very special country for me. It's a country that stays with you even after leaving it. Even after you leave Yemen, Yemen does not leave you. And it's not a secret that if I had the opportunity, I would return to Yemen at any time. And I hope that even in a personal capacity, I wish you the best and I wish you the best in the dialogue and the work that you are doing. An important juncture again, um, uh, there's renewed hope, there's chances for dialogue instead of conflict. 
Um, but since I'm currently not working on the Yemen file, I will um, I will leave it to the experts to talk about the current situation um, and rather um, tell the story of how it all started or how I remember uh, how it all started and um, uh, and say a few words about what we can possibly learn from that experience, not only for, for Yemen, but also for other contexts uh, in the region. Um, so let's start at the beginning, um, or maybe even before with a question, what do you need to set up an international support program for a national dot and dialogue? What, what are the ingredients? Um, and since I'm working for a government, I'll start with the governmental side. You need an international partner that um, is credible and accepted by all the relevant political actors, um, which uh, as I was convinced initially, I'll get to that by, uh, uh, by Ali Saif Hassan and others, uh, Germany was in the privileged to, uh, position to, uh, to play that role. Um, you need on the non-governmental side, you need a capable and experienced uh, partner, uh, an international NGO, uh, if you will. Um, and of course, the Burka Foundation uh, played that role and it continues to play that role uh, very importantly. Um, locally, you need a partner that enjoys the trust of all sides. Um, and uh, I think the political dialogue forum, Ali Saif Hassan in particular, and his team um, have uh, played that that role um, very effectively. And then um, I should also mention: sometimes you need a catalyzer; you need someone to bring them all together. Um, I'm not sure if Mahmoud Qayah from the Friedrich Ebert Foundation is around, but uh, he did play a, 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 an important initial role. And then, of course, once you get the whole thing started, you need uh, parties, you need stakeholders, you need political leaders that are open to dialogue and ready to make it a success and then translate it uh, and translate its outcomes into political reality. I will come back to that. Um, it all started in late 2011, uh, around the time that uh, Ali Abdullah Saleh signed the GCC agreement in Riyadh, if you remember. I'm not entirely sure if it was before or after, but there were some informal discussions. I think it was at my house in, in Sana'a. Uh, where Mahmoud Qayah uh, from the Friedrich Ivan Foundation introduced me to Ali Saif Hassan. Uh, and both were convinced that Germany could play the, the uh, role as an international broker, as an international uh, supporter that could bring all Yemeni parties together, that had the trust of all Yemeni parties and was, was uh, able to, um, to initiate a, a national dialogue. Um, they ended up convincing me and I uh, then had to convince my headquarters um, that that uh, was, was worth, um, worth a try. Um, and uh, then we looked for a capable German partner, uh, which we quickly found with the Burkhoff Foundation. Um, the rest, as they say, <laughs> is, is history. Um, Sonia mentioned the, uh, the all party uh, meeting that we had in, uh, uh, in Potsdam, I think it was in mid-March 2012, um, uh, which uh, to, to a, a very large extent was um, the achievement of, of uh, both Ali Saif Hassan and, um, and uh, the, the Burkhoff Foundation to organize that. Um, it was seen as a breakthrough by, by everyone. Um, and uh, it, it gave uh, important first Im initial impetus to what would later become the official national dialogue conference, um, uh, which uh, was set up uh, by, the, uh, by the United Nations, uh, uh, together with, um, of course, with, 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 the, with the Yemeni official partners, with the, um, um, uh, with the, uh, the interim government um, that was there. And uh, that was um, something that I, in my current uh, position in, in, in Iraq, where di national dialogue is also a very big issue, I, I, I mention almost at a daily, uh, on a daily basis to uh, my interlocutors as, as a very important experience and, and a very successful experience in the sense that it was a very well organized uh, national dialogue with with very engaged participants that had a good representation of, of, of women that had a good representation of youth that had all the relevant political actors uh, at the table um, that had uh, uh, input from various international uh, partners. Um, of course, the Burka Foundation, also other international institutions like the Max Planck Institute, German institutions and international institutions, um, brought their experience to um, to the to the conference, um, and I was able to assist some of those meetings, 
at the time where, for instance, the German experience uh, of reunification, which is something that uh, both Germany and Yemen experienced in 1999 with very different outcomes, um, where uh, the goal was to allow by comparing and contrasting um, the, the two experiences um, to, to, to look for, for solutions um, um, to uh, uh, enable the, well, what was still a united uh, Yemen at the time, um, to, um, to, to be a, a success. Um, uh, the outcomes I remember were, 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 were well documented. Um, and they, uh, I didn't say until the very end of the, of the dialogue I left in the uh, summer of 2013, um, but I do remember that there was a lot of hope. Uh, there was increasing frustration also uh, from the fact that the outcomes of the national dialogues were in a way, um, weren't, there was no transmission into political reality, um, and and this is something I think that uh, a lesson learned that we need to that we need to look at. Um, of course, things uh, uh, went wrong uh, after that. We had the civil war, and I'm not going to go into uh, any detail because that is not my uh, uh, my my uh, area of expertise. You all know much more about that than I do. Um, but um, but the lesson learned also for uh, other contexts, for playing countries like Iraq, for countries like uh, Libya, for instance, um, where Germany is also playing a, a role as a mediator, um, uh, that uh, we need to look at um, ways to ensure that these national dialogues and their outcomes don't just remain in in Sana'a was the move and pick hotel, uh, it may be another hotel somewhere else, uh, but that they actually um, uh, become a political reality on the street. Um, I think I'm running out of time. So I wanna make one last point. Um, uh, the question, was it, was it in vain? Uh, I would emphatically say no. Um, even if the first round of a national dialogue uh, in Yemen um, uh, did not bring um, peace and stability, I think it is still, um, an important experience um, in the sense that um, the path to good governance, I'm not going to say democracy, but the ultimate goal is to have better government governance, um, is, is always a, a path full of trial and errors. Uh, it was the same for Germany, it was the same for many, I mean, we had some of the biggest uh, horrors in, in, in history that, um, that taught us some uh, relevant lessons. And as Oscar Wilde said, um, experience is just the name we give to our past mistakes. Um, um, if you're lucky, you can you don't have to make those experiences yourself. You can learn from the experience of others, and this is why um, why having uh, international support for a national dialogue, I think, is is very very useful. Um, and I look forward to the discussions here on um, the uh, the lessons that we can learn uh, for Yemen, of course, um, but maybe also for other countries um, from from this dialogue. Look at what was what was successful and what needs to be improved, what can we, can we learn um, for the future. And, and of course, uh, needless to say, I, I uh, first and foremost, I hope for the national dialogue in Yemen to be a great success, um, not only for the benefit of Yemenis, but also because I'd love to go back to Sana'a. Thank you very much, and I wish you fruitful discussions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Philip, for, for sharing your thoughts, your reflections. Uh, also for highlighting some dilemmas. It's tempting to invite you also for, for further discussions where we go deeper into the experiences from Yemen also for other countries. Um, so it's, it's, it's great to have you here once again. And uh, I would like to also address the audience briefly by saying that we will now move towards our, our panel discussion, but it's also important for us that you can contribute to, to the discussion. So we would like to invite you to all send in your questions or comments through the chat function. And towards the end of the session, we will have some time also to take up some of, of these questions. So zooming back into Yemen, my first question is, is actually to, to Ali Saif Hassan. Ali Saif is, is the co-director of the Political Dialogue Support Program. He's also the director of the Political Development Forum in Yemen, our long-term partner. And together we've started the political dialogue support program. Basically at the time in 2012, it was the national dialogue support program. We later renamed it according to, to the situation in Yemen. And throughout the years, the program has changed a lot of course. And 
after the war broke out, we have increasingly focused on also um, establishing, maintaining and supporting channels of communication and dialogue between the Yemeni parties. Over the years, many additional components have been added. Uh, today, I would say it's a rather comprehensive uh, dialogue program with regular multi-party dialogues in Yemen, in Sana'a and Taiz, in Aden, but also consultation meetings outside Yemen, where the parties can come together, where we try to also develop options to support the UN-led process. And there have been uh, more grounded components added to the program over the year, one on inclusive local governance and one on community safety that also works in the various Yemeni uh, governorates. We will, of course, hear much more about this engagement throughout these sessions. Ali, I would like to, to start with you with the question of going back to Going 10 years back, why was it so important to start this work in 2012? And how did the main components of the political dialogues, dialogue support program emerge? And what do they aim to achieve? What's their, what's their use and what's their purpose? Ali, the floor is yours. Shukran, Gajiran. Thank you very much, Sonia. I am very happy to to, to meet in person and virtually to finally see my, my dear friend, Philip. We started by working on the very first steps of this program. And he was a dear friend even before we started thinking about dialogue. He was always with us in our meetings and discussions in Sana'a and knew each other very well. I will start by talking about the nature of this idea, the nature of the idea behind the National Dialogue Conference and how it was born out of the GCC agreement. The idea was presented during the GCC agreement in a very specific form, that there would be a national dialogue conference. And as is known, there's a national dialogue, which is broader than the idea of a specific conference for national dialogue. And I remember at the time, I remember my very first discussions with my partner, my dear friend, Dr. Oliver Wills, when we were talking about the difference between a national dialogue process as a broader idea and a national dialogue conference as a specific event. When the idea was proposed in the GCC initiative, it was take, quickly taken over by the 10 sponsor states. There were the five permanent members of the Security Council that were involved, as well as the members of the Gulf Cooperative Council. When we look at these states, how many of these states work towards, work towards framing and transforming conflicts and in order to achieve sustainable and permanent political development, you will find that these kinds of processes are very limited in these states. And so for us, it was very important to try to think about ending this monopoly of these two groups of states in sponsoring, managing, and administering the National Dialogue Conference because we wanted to open a broader space and platform for Yemeni voices and political parties. When we think about the international community outside of the scope, of the permanent members of the Security Council and outside of the scope of the GCC states. When we thought about what countries could be involved, we, we looked at what countries were the countries that had supported Yemen the most. And at the forefront of these states was Germany. And we tried to find which states had an excellent economic, developmental, and political relationship and was had a deep and entrenched friendship and, and credibility with the Yemeni parties. And the only country that we found, one that was not, whose reputation was not linked to a specific political agenda or political interest was Germany. And so we wanted to, we wanted to speak to Germany about this so that Germany could play a role in, the, in Yemen's National Dialogue Conference. And so that we can achieve a breakthrough in this monopoly by these 10 states when it came to the National Dialogue Conference. And my dear friend, Philip, played a very important role in the response and in breaking through this barrier. And we started with the first steps. With regards, to, so now we've addressed why Germany, but why the Berghoff Foundation? If, if you think about it, if you look at our core objectives, the core objectives of the political dialogue forum 
it's a, it's obviously an entity in its name that says political dialogue. And our slogan, which is towards sustain safe and sustainable political development. This is our identity at the PDF, and that is who we are. The Berghoff Foundation's identity, which is also very clearly represented in its slogan, is transforming conflict. It's not a transfer of power. Its objective is not just to, to quickly move towards a political settlement, but to actually transform conflict. And this is a long-term process. And so we felt like this was a natural partnership because of our agreement and in, in, in the approaches and the visions that we had as institutions. My dear friend and colleague Oliver will speak later on, and he could give if he could give a brief idea about Berghoff's approach and understanding of this idea of transforming conflict, which is totally in line with our slogan of towards sustainable and safe political development. And so our approaches were in line in selecting Berghoff and, so, and selecting Germany as a mediator. When we started our work, our core, the core value that was at the foundation of, of our work was that we needed to transform this conflict because we understood at the time that there is a political conflict and a military conflict as well has been ongoing in Yemen even before 2010 and 2011. There was a conflict in Saida. There was a conflict in the South as well. And so the concept of dialogue, in our opinion, was more than just a transfer of power, and which was the focus of the GCC initiative. The GCC initiative was based on a project to transfer power, but not to transform the conflict and not to lay the foundation for safe and sustainable political development. We started by launching a dialogue with all of the political parties in dialogue before all the political parties in Potsdam. We worked with experts who were invited to, who were invited to provide information and expertise to the technical committee to to the Yemeni political parties the technical committee preparing for the national dialogue conference was very closed because the united nations wanted to ensure that it was that this was done under its auspices and so our first visit with these experts was to the leaders of the political parties in their homes where they were able to give them information and expertise uh, and to this very concept that Oliver spoke about at length in, in Potsdam, about the idea of dialogue being a symphony where everyone had to work together. With regards to how the components of the political dialogue were formed, our understanding of the ongoing conflict in Yemen is that it is a complex uh, conflict. Some people say it is a civil war, some people say it is a foreign aggression or a foreign transnational war, but we believe that it is more than just one of these ideas. There is a civil war component, there is a conflict with the region and neighboring states. And so it was very important for us as the as the National Dialogue Support Program and the Political Dialogue Support Program to be there wherever wherever the warring parties were. There was a primary actor in Sun'a, so we have to be there in Sun'a operating with them. There is a primary actor in Adan we have to be there. There's a primary actor in Ta'iz, then we have to be there as well. We are wherever the warring parties are. And our presence is not limited to just inside Yemen, but we also have programmatic extensions abroad. At the regional level, we have a separate process and track for strategic think tanks in the region, whether from Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Qatar, Oman, and Kuwait. We discuss these issues at the regional level. At the international level, we've had repeated, we have successive meetings in, in Germany, in Jordan, in Switzerland. So we try to be wherever the parties, the local, regional uh, parties to the conflict are, wherever important international actors are. Uh, that's what I, that was my answer. Back to you, Son. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ali, for um, placing basically the work in, in how it emerged at the time, but also how it developed and how important it was to flexibly adjust to to the political situation, but also to, to what the parties needed at the time and what also the UN process needed or what we could, could offer to, to support continuous engagement. 
I would now like to uh, turn to Maim. Maim al has been working with the program for, for many, many years. She's an old friend of us. She's a human rights lawyer. And she's also the coordinator of the political dialogue support program in Taiz, as well as, as the coordinator of the community safety in Taiz. Maim, I would like to ask you from your experience uh, in Taiz as a very, as one of the hotspots of the war divided city, how does the PDSP work on the ground? How do you work in Taiz? And can you please describe the work of the political dialogue support program in and for Taiz? Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, uh, thank you, Sonia, for this uh, uh, for allowing me to speak uh, in this very important event on the work of uh, PDSP in Taiz. Uh, allow me, please, because we have only a short time uh, to speak about uh, the work of the program in Taiz, uh, because we started the, uh, the work as uh, the as the first. Uh, Governor Aid. I remember that on the 30th of, uh, of September 2012, we held uh, the first event for the PDSP, and that was actually supporting the national dialogue in a major event or in a key event uh, uh, that included dialogues facilitated by Dr. Uh, Oliver. This was the first event after that. We uh, developed the work and we started uh, engaging uh, the local parties in a Taz dialogue in parallel with the NDC uh, in Sana. Uh, of course, uh, this local dialogue included all components uh, in the governorate of uh, Taiz, uh, political and civil society organizations and actors and activists. Uh, and we worked in the low in the local dialogue until uh, the uh, interlocutors uh, uh, developed a matrix uh, that included uh, the most important issues which were pending around the, the uh, government of Taiz. The matter developed in Taiz, and it did not. Uh, we, we we developed the work, and we called it the the Janet Dialogue Forum. Uh, and we we had uh, political actors uh, from Ib, uh, from the governorate of Ib, as well as from the governorate of Taiz, and we continued the work until the war started. And after the war, it was difficult for us to bring the participants or the interlocutors uh, uh, and members of the forum in joint meetings due to the division of the governorate and the closure of the government and the, and the, uh, the governorate, and it was difficult for politicians. Uh, to move about between uh, Taiz and uh, but uh, the work started from the beginning of the war until 2019 in the Janet the dialogue forum to discuss uh, issues related to Taiz and also the issues that uh, that are uh, that were uh, consequences of the war such as the exchange of prisoners and detainees and the opening of roads the forum played a key role in uh, and, and bringing uh, the personalities and figures either from inside the country or outside the country who are actually concerned with Taiz and the opening of the roads. Uh, after that, we developed the the work, and from 2020 until now, we have been working with the leaders of political parties in Taiz and women and civil society organizations, as well as the private sector. Uh, the, uh, the, the component we called it as uh, Taiz consultations, as well as the local authorities also participating in these consultations. The, the, uh, we, we, we directly said that, that we want to pay attention to the issues facing Taiz and to mitigate their impact and to mitigate the impact of the war as well as the conflicts between political parties. We have started uh, in this direction and uh, we also uh, uh, 
paid attention to issues relevant to tariffs, such as water, such as uh, hygiene and, and sanitation and services issues of concern to the people. This was the focus of our work during the past two years. And also the meeting of the political parties, uh, uh, even though they have the tensions between them, we, we call the, the way they have also uh, you know, immediate uh, 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 tensions between the political parties, and that would impact the work of the local authority. Uh, and but due to the meetings that we have organized, it has actually uh, bridged the gap between the political parties, and uh, uh, and we start, uh, the, and, and the local authorities started responding to the outcomes of these meetings. Uh, and, and that is a, a, a very important uh, matter. The, the, the citizens have started seeing a change, which have uh, been the direct consequences of the dialogues uh, led by the Taez consultations supported by PDF and Virgo Foundation. This is in brief. Uh, to uh, the, um, uh, the brief about what is being uh, organized by PDF and Virgo Foundation for supporting the dialogue and the governorate of Taiz. Well, on, on my behalf and on behalf of all uh, the people of Taiz, we thank uh, PDF and we thank Virgo Foundations because they have continued supporting Taiz uh, during the dire times uh, to, uh, to help uh, provide services to the community. This is a brief what I wanted to say about PDSP in Taiz and all the activities that we uh, carry out. We also hold a continuous monthly meeting and, and we're continuing to work on all issues of concern to the citizens. Which are under the uh, the microscope at these moments as a result of the war, because there have been many gaps in the services provided to the citizens. But we have achieved many changes. Uh, the people, the people have already felt them, but they do not know who's behind them. Why? Because we do our activities uh, uh, without actually uh, promoting them through the media, so no one knows uh, behind that. And thank you. Uh, uh, very much, Sonia. And we would we would like to thank you, uh, Jane, uh, uh, for for your excellent work these these years, last years. Uh, also for coming to Berlin, actually, at the occasion of of our our birthday, knowing how difficult it also is to to travel. And we will also look uh, more into a little bit the the future of of your assessment of of the situation in Thais in in a moment. So thanks a lot for sharing these thoughts and also. Um, remaining a little bit optimistic at, at some points where, where it's possible. I would like to now um, introduce Oliver Wills. He's the head of our MENA department at the Worker Foundation, and he's the co-director of the Political Dialogue Support Program together with Ali Saif. Oliver, to you, I would like to ask you the question what the PDSP program has basically achieved in the last 10 years, and how would you describe the impact? What, what are maybe some success stories that you can share and, and what is the evaluation of, of the usefulness and the impact of this kind of work? Thank you so much, Sonia. Um, of course, we have, a, as Philip has said in the beginning, we have a truth at the moment, which is really a great, a great step, but it's very fragile. We have a situation where Yemeni parties, the region and the international committee so far has not succeeded really to establish or to implement a sustainable peace process. So in this, in this context, I think I would like to bring in a portion of uh, a level of mod modesty when we discuss what we have achieved. So we, we are talking about political dialogues. We're talking about a specific tool, a tool that is strong if it can complement political discussions. And I think that is something we used extensively we worked, collaborated very closely with the UN. And in order to complement, prepare the parties, to bring in parties who have not been so much on the radar or have not had the chance to participate in these discussions, we used these forums to talk about very sensitive issues that probably the UN or others cannot easily address because they are probably too sensitive or potentially risky. 
and we talk about generating new ideas. And I think that's a spectrum of what we can what we can offer. I think given this constrained or this more limited, modest approach to what what success or achievements might might entail, I, I think we have achieved a lot, and we have achieved uh, tangible outcomes and and intangible outcomes and. Just using this opportunity, uh, I think one of the non-tangible or intangible outcomes I would like to highlight from the beginning and, and, and put first is our relationship with PDF, which not just uh, developed very strongly, but I think that was one of the cornerstones of our success. Uh, it's, I think, based on complementarity. It's based on partnership on eye level. It's based on friendships. It's, you know, not just between us and Ali Saif and, and Nadia, but it's also based on, uh, on a staff which is really very professional, a staff that is very passionate. And so we can really work on you know, dialogues, political dialogues outside, political dialogues inside the country. So we can, we can really play the whole spectrum of, of, of inside and outside support and, and, and formats. Uh, but also we can bring in expertise from Worker Foundation and as we heard before and, and discussed and, and much better local understanding and, and, and knowledge. And I think that's the basis for our, for our, for our work. And I think that was super important. Um, if we talk about other intangible, non-visible non outcomes, I would say it's also the, the convening power that we still have uh, together. And I think it's very high and it has remained high if not even increased so for me that's something that we have achieved which we might call trust or acceptance from the parties so they 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 know that the meetings the dialogue meetings are useful for them that we are not uh, putting them in a difficult position and i think that's that's super important they understand also better how this functions so i think also in a way we have uh, helped setting you know a bit the understanding of of dialogue processes and and of a particular type of of dialogue processes and um so so also you know in a in a way that that parties uh, understand that you know the informality and the confidentiality that we are offering is a chance for them we had lots of problems in the beginning with our concept of uh, engaging with all parties, what we call work of multipartiality. So we are not neutral, but we, we rather try to work with all parties intensively and understand what are their particular needs and interests and concerns. And that was, of course, like in many conflicts, the polarization is so high that people, many people did not really understand and, and some did really not appreciate. I think that also has changed a lot. So what I want to say is, that the, the conditions for our work have changed a lot. And I think we have not just been able to keep a momentum and keep relevant, but I think that has really been strengthened over the years. And also our, our engagement, you know, in a way has deepened. So, we, so I think in terms of our relation with the, with the Yemeni actors, the major stake, the all major stakeholders has become more deepened and more intensive. And I think that's, that's an achievement by itself. Um, the dialogues that we that we run and we run different formats as we heard you know from very local dialogues where also we have also very tangible outcomes mine mentioned the uh, prisoner exchange in ties we have also in other dialogues at more governorate level success cases about um, you know opening health stations or health centers educational facilities facilities uh, providing uh, political mediation at a local level to open up you know, water pump stations. So, so very concrete uh, support to communities or with community safety also to improve access to the legal system. So I think this is one level of success, but we have also very tangible uh, levels of success when it comes to ideas that are transferred and can or that entered reality in a way that they created reality. I mean, we have been working closely with the UN before Kuwait, very closely. So the, the meetings we organized were in a way a preparatory to Kuwait talks and the, the agenda, the sequencing of the talks, the, the principles of the talks and some of the mechanisms 
that were discussed later were a direct outcome of, of consultation meetings that we organized with the UN um, uh, being, being present. But also other topics uh, are established, I think, are part of now the narrative or part of part of a common understanding that these topics need to be addressed in the peace process. So, you know, one is related to government issues, the, the role of local authorities, you know, the whole sub-national infrastructure is that this is uh, the in, in a way the forefront for service provision and needs to be needs to be preserved, needs to be strengthened. I think that's now a very clear topic in a peace process. There are also very clear mechanisms how this can be strengthened and supported. But also in our discussions um, with the role of localities in Yemen, I think we helped open the door for the establishment of the Presidential Leadership Council, which also has the representation of Yemeni regions, you know, as one of the founding ideas. And as we heard from one of the senior, senior members of the council, that uh, providing the unity of the political uh, parties or so the environment for this PLC was also a very necessary step to, to open these so to open these these doors. And I think I leave it with this and hand back to, to you, Sonia. Thanks a lot for, for these reflections and also for um, mentioning some of the challenges and how things um, how things evolved and, and also linking it back to, to today. Actually, you mentioned a lot the cooperation with the UN. I think it's it's important to mention that this was really one of our um, key focus areas also to make sure that all our activities are very closely coordinated. Uh, we had hoped that also Roxana Bazagan would be able to join today. She had actually planned to join today. She was already advising uh, back in 2012 with the UN team under the lead of back then envoy uh, Jamal Ben Umar. And now she, after many, many other mediation uh, engagements in the context of the UN, she is now actually heading the UN office in Sana'a. Unfortunately, she had to withdraw on short notice because the UN envoy is visiting Sana'a now in relation to uh, talks to extending the truce. So unfortunately, we cannot hear from her today. Um, so I just wanted to mention the, the importance of, of this coordination again. So we have uh, had a first round that looked a lot, lot also of how our program came about and how it evolved over time. I would now like to hand over to Nadia for a second round that would also look more into the future. And I would once again like to invite all uh, participants in the audience to also send their questions in the chat so that we can take them up later. Thanks and over to you, Nadia. Shukran, shukran, uh, thank you very much, Sonia. And I would like to thank the previous speakers of the first round. Allow me in the beginning to encourage the participants to write their questions in the Q and A uh, uh, Q and A uh, panel. Uh, we will start with the second round with Dr. Oliver, the head of the MENA department in Berghoff Foundation. Uh, you, Dr. Oliver, in the first round you spoke about integration, partnership, trust, and the passion that have accompanied the work of PDF and Bergamo Foundation, which has led to many uh, tangible uh, 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 outcomes uh, that we as PDF and uh, the, the, uh, the, have become proud of, and we have also been able to leave an impact on the ground. This is a rich experience uh, that we can uh, can uh, that we can uh, take away a number of lessons learned for peace building in Yemen and the other part uh, of the question, which uh, I want you also to to, uh, to respond to. Can these uh, the lessons learned be used in other contexts uh, for peace building uh, uh, in different uh, conflicts uh, that may be, uh, that we may apply this approach to those conflicts or those contexts? Thank you, Nadia. Uh, I, I mean, can we apply it? Of course, there are a number of, of lessons that can be can be applied also in a more general context. Uh, the first one, of course, is, is an obvious one, but we often forget about it. This is that 
that our engagement is long term. Ali has mentioned that you know for Berkhoff it's about conflict transformation. So we are not so much focusing on got, on just fixing a problem. We are really aiming to create the conditions and uh, the mechanisms and the the processes that help the parties to solve their own issues here in a peaceful way, in a political manner, not not by resorting by resorting to violence. I know that Yemen is still far away from that from that situation, uh, but celebrating now ten years, yeah, obviously, obviously, and that was never planned. Also from our side, you know, we the the, the project cycle and what we focused on was very much uh, the task at the moment. And in a way, we forgot that that you know we should be prepared to stay engaged for for long term. Uh, so in in a way, I would say. You know, in hindsight, these complex conflicts, and Ali has uh, a little bit outlined, you know, that the Yemeni conflict is, cannot easily be described. It has a lot of uh, local ingredients. It is actually, I would say, in essence, it is also a very local conflict about governance, about power, about resources. But it is also a regional conflict. It is also a, an international conflict to some extent. It's ideological. It's uh, it's it involves history. It involves uh, a lot of grievances from the past. Uh, probably greed. You know, war economy. I mean, so many topics pop up if you think about Yemen. That uh, you know, we have to be modest in in terms also of what we can achieve and how. So I think that's true in many many similar contexts. And we have to be persistent. So to stay engaged. We also have to learn to deal with frustrations because at times we were very hopeful that things uh, are going in a, in a very nice direction. Philip has mentioned the optimism that was uh, was there when the National Dialogue Conference started, or probably even the first uh, through the, the conference, most of the time there was a lot of optimism, not just by naive outsiders. Also, I think a lot of Yemenis were very, very optimistic. Uh, so but also us as a program and how to deal with frustration. And one thing that we learned, and I think we, we mentioned it a bit, but I think it was also a, in a way a logical evolution is that only working at the dialogue level, only working on political dialogue, sometimes, you know, this is very fragile. Uh, dialogues, if they are linked to political processes as ours is in many cases, not the local one, but the national political dialogues are very much, um, designed to complement a political process, it's then, of course, very fragile. If there's no political process, also what to do then? You know, we can still look ahead of in, important topics, but it, it loses its relevance if there is no political process. It makes it much more complicated. And once we realized this, we started to, to ground our dialogues more in also other tracks of activities. We used outcomes of the dialogues in, in very concrete terms practically about the role of, of local authorities, the, the role of governorates in providing services in uh, you, know, you know also basic state functions in a situation where the nation state is more or less uh, fragmented and, and disabled. So we took it from the dialogues and we started to, to work at those levels to, to design projects, you know, using our contacts, using our knowledge, using our, you know, the arguments that we heard, the, the, we, we had a very clear understanding of what is needed and of some ideas. So we used this for our own work. We started then provide concrete support at, you know, strengthening local governance, you know, also providing uh, material support through a parallel GIZ pro program. And I, I think that's that was important to ground our dialogue. We also further expanded then uh, working with communities, uh, improving access to, to, to justice and, and to improve the relation with police, you know, also with very, very concrete um, ideas. And again, the, the basic idea came from the, from the dialogues. It opened the doors. We could use the context that we had to the political elite that we had uh, fostered and, and created uh, through the dialogues and the other way around, um, working on these very concrete um, areas also helped us to better understand what is really, how is the situation on the ground, what is needed, and uh, what are the options, what, what could be done actually to improve the situation. And I think that was, so to, 
to ground the dialogue. That's that was a lesson learned. I think that is relevant for a lot of different uh, contexts, uh, and especially if we think about the weakness of dialogues. But it also helped to deal with frustration because at the local level we realize we can achieve much more. Sometimes it's very quick because not much is, is needed and uh, it can be provided. While at the national level, of course, you know, things become very, very difficult. And if there's uh, no, no, um, if there's no political, if there's no political will, so then, then it's really, really difficult. Um, uh, and I think, you know, also based on this uh, broadening and deepening our engagement, we also uh, understood after, you know, the last years, especially that the region is also an, an essential part of a solution that needs to be brought in. There is very little open discussion in the region about Yemen and the different options and the red lines and, uh, you know, the, the a vision. And, and for Yemen, so we started to engage also the Gulf states and, and the international community at large. And this is, um, this is also important because it helped us then, and that's probably my, my final, um, my last, uh, lessons learned that could be generalized is we usually we usually have had a, a practice of providing space to Yemenis and give Yemenis a space for dialogue and listening to them and we would not take responsibility for working on a solution ourselves but having worked so long and so intensively in Yemen as a program we all together we, we realize at a certain point that it's also needed that we take responsibilities to to, to, to draft, to think about elements for, for a peace process that is based on this knowledge so that we have gathered so much experience and with that responsibility that is needed, especially in a situation where the political elite in Yemen is not able and willing anymore to formulate a political solution or, or a unified vision and also where the region is not contributing to this discussion. And internationally, there's a lot of question marks. So this is something that is ongoing. It's also a new development for us. And uh, that's something, you know, I think it will be also interesting. The, the, the lesson here is not just to provide space, but also when the opportunity arises to be a bit more bold, provide, provide also ideas for a solution. And I think we are now testing this much more systematic than we ever did. Thank you. Shukran, shukran, Dr. Oliver. Uh, thank you, thank you, Dr. Oliver, and thank you for the spaces uh, that have been provided for the conflicting party to discuss and to engage. Uh, and we'd like to express appreciation for this space that have been able to achieve many things during the past 10 years at the political level, at the community level, at the level of community safety as well. Allow me to move for, uh, to my dear colleague, Mu'ayn al Abidi and Mayan has been introduced by Saudiya, uh, but I would like to ask you two specific questions. So one uh, personal question, one about your work in the past 10 years. The personal question is how have you been able during the past 10 years to, to, to go through all these successes and failures uh, at, the, at the, the mental level or the psychological level from the summit of the dialogue to the uh, outskirts of the war? How have you been able to do with this and you continue to be steadfast and professional? Uh, and uh, 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 and I also uh, would like to ask uh, the other question, which is the lessons learned uh, that we can uh, we can mention from your work in managing dialogues and in mediation and facilitations of the working groups, and 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 how have you uh, uh, seen the, the confidence and trust develop uh, in the work on the work of uh, PDF and Burgo Foundation? The microphone is yours. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Nadia. I think this is an, an unexpected question uh, uh, to, uh, to, to, to ask me to ask about my personal experience, uh, 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 to be fair. Uh, 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 
I, I may have uh, uh, been a student of uh, Ali Zayf. That was what made, made me to deal with all these failures and the successes, and also taught me how to deal with political parties. I'm not a politician. I'm, a, I'm not a member of a political party, but our work usually was on the legal side. But our relationship is excellent with all the parties because the, the legal work uh, uh, also is, is involved with everyone. And I, as a person, I, I, I could deal with all the persons and parties. But dealing with political parties, deal need a special treatment. Uh, I, I have to be one on one distance from everyone. It's difficult that you show even your personal conviction to any party because that may impact the work in general. And therefore, I learned at the hands of uh, uh, Mr. Ali Saif, and he was a good mentor, uh, and as a result of his instructions, and this is a fact that, that I cannot deny, I have been able to deal with the political parties, especially in Taiz, because the political parties in Taiz are not easy to deal with. And, uh, 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 and, and the matter is not so easy to deal with also. Uh, uh, maybe my en my engagement in the 11th of February revolution had played a role in, uh, in, uh, in forging relationships with all parties, uh, either th those who have become uh, uh, parties to the war, there are parties in Sana'a, there are parties in Ta'az and, and different parties, but ultimately, or at the end, uh, my relationships are good with everyone and I'm neutral with everyone. Uh, and I have been working on humanitarian issues uh, that are of concern to the people and provide a service to the people. And I do not intervene in the visions and the convictions. Uh, you know, visions and convictions. Uh, I put them aside uh, so that we uh, we succeed in our work and we achieve acceptance of our work. Uh, thank God, uh, I, we have been accepted by everyone. And and to invest. Uh, uh, I actually invested my relationships with all these people. Thank you very much, Maeen. أنا يمكن أرجع لكم مرة ثانية أنا أو أو سونيا. Thank you, Maeen. I I I might come back to you myself or Sonia, so be prepared to answer more questions in the Q and A session. But Ali, my question to you is: working in a difficult environment, especially one that is politically difficult, like Yemen, requires certain skills and requires a certain way of dealing with the political parties. And this is true during times of peace and more so during times of war. And so the work done by and the activities of civil society organizations in this period after 2015 is like wading through a minefield. How has the PDSP in this very difficult environment, in this very divided and fragmented environment, have been able to actually achieve any success on the ground, whether at the local level or at the regional international levels. Thank you, Dr. Nadia. Thank you, Maeen for speaking about your experience, but I wanted to add something that a political, the political experience that I have gained um, throughout the period that I lived through when my generation was, was one of, of political optimism. My generation was very involved in politics in that period in time in Yemen's history. And so gaining this political experience, gaining the experience of working within political parties in that system was something that was necessary at the time. But before working on this political process, before working on these dialogues, I had been, I had reached the conviction that it was necessary to move forward from working inside the political sphere into working with politics. So I'm not a politician, but I work very closely with political activities and political parties. And I think that's an important difference. Those working within politics care about political platforms. We care about political platforms. We, we, we're not concerned with who governs, who rules, who wins and who loses. What I care about personally is that we need to be convinced and, and, and have full belief in these ideas 
and to be neutral, to have an equal distance, to be equidistant from the parties doesn't mean that you're representing one or the other, you, but you have to be fully convinced that this is necessary, that we're working in the political sphere while not actually being politicians. And so this philosophy or this idea, along with the experience that I had in the political sphere has led to the this idea of trying to engineer or to engineer these different distances of having equal distances in our relationship with all of the parties. We do not want to get too close to them, but at the same time, we don't want to get too far. If you get too close to them, they expect things from you that you fully know you cannot provide. Whereas if you get too far away, you will become more and more confused and they will not understand you as you want them to. And it's important that we are also fully believe that the Yemeni political elites are very limited and they're always in touch with each other. You cannot say one thing to one party and something completely different to another party. What you say in your visions and your views and your principles must all be clear, very clearly presented because everyone will discuss them, whether formally or informally. And this is something that it's not sufficient for you to just talk about, but something that you prove throughout your years of work with them. My relationship with these parties has been ongoing for years, before the war, before the Arab Spring, that we know each other at the personal level, we know each other throughout these different political developments and events in Yemen's political history. And so this relationship is, is a very long-standing one. It's not one that you can create overnight. And so the idea is to invest in these relationships and I based all of that in engineering this equal distance with all of the parties. And like the Burghoff Foundation focuses on transforming conflict, and we focus on a very similar concept of developing political or of sustainable political development. These are very closely related ideas and they complete each other in the work that we do. We are now in a stage of trying to transform the conflict. We cannot talk about sustainable political development, but after a certain amount of time, it could be long, it could be short, we will never know. But after we succeed in working together, and we can't do this individually, we can't do this on our own. Everyone is trying to do everything they can to ensure the success of this process. But when we, when we succeed in transforming the conflict, into a state of peace, of political settlement, then we can start working alongside our partners at the Burghoff Foundation to support, to support and lay the foundation for safe and sustainable political development in order to ensure that the situation in Yemen does not go back into a state of war. What has happened at the, what happened at the National Dialogue Conference and the results of it that we are living through now is that the real root causes of the conflict, and I think we have colleagues here from Damar, and this is the same from Damar, that we fight and fight and fight, and then we forget what we were fighting about if we do not answer the core questions that led to this conflict in the first part. Whether internally amongst us Yemenis or with the region, we need to answer these questions. We need to provide real solutions that take into account the root causes of the conflict, whether they are with, at their core being the, the form of the state and state building. And also we need to take into account the regional factors that led to others being involved in this war. If we do not deal with these root causes, then we will not be able to actually transform the conflict. We might be able to transfer power from one party to another. We might be successful in reaching a temporary political settlement. We might be successful in having a long-term truce, but we will not succeed in actually transforming the conflict and laying the foundation for safe and sustainable political development. The only way to do this is to deal with the latent reasons and causes of the conflict and at their core, what the state looks like and what relationship it will have with neighboring countries. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ali. After hearing from you, after hearing from our panelists, we wanted to leave some time for the questions from the attendees at this event. There was a question that we had and wanted to ask, but it seems like the participants also want to understand. What are the challenges that the PDSP has faced over the past 10 years? And have your efforts 
have the efforts to overcome these challenges help strengthen the program? So the Berghoff Foundation has faced challenges and the PDF has, has faced challenges as well. And so if we could hear from Oliver over the next two minutes and then Ali safe for two minutes after that uh, and answering this question and the, what were the challenges and then we will take some questions from Sonia. Dr. Oliver, go, please go ahead. Thank you, good, good question. I, I think one of the challenges I, I outlined and I think it's really important, political dialogue, the way we conduct it as a, as a supportive dialogue, not as a replacement of negotiations, depend on negotiations to take place on a political process. And, and that's, you know, if that's not happening, then also the usefulness of having a dialogue at the national political elite level gets more complicated. And uh, that was one of the reasons why we have broadened our engagement. And what we always did was uh, also to work on, on local dialogue, which is much more tangible and can create uh, success stories. Not always, not everywhere. And so Mai knows how frustrating it is to work on ties, where very little could have is, is moving. But there, there were success cases, of course, as well in ties. And the prisoner exchange was one of those really highlights and, and, a, and a very important uh, achievement. So we have broadened the, the project also to work more on, on those areas where we can continue to work and also keep contact to, to the actors with whom we engage, but through different means. So, and, and also to, to deal with, you know, to, to, you know, instead of waiting for better times to work on those areas where work is possible. So also to shift a bit the focus in a way. Um, there is another challenge which I always failed is uh, working with political elites, which we in a way consider important because these are, you know, those people who should take and have responsibility and knowledge and we want to benefit from those knowledges. But uh, among the political elites, the, the number of women in leadership positions is quite limited. Had we worked from the beginning in a way that we knew we would stay for a long time, we might have started in the beginning to, uh, in, to support especially women who are in leadership position in political parties and movements, so to push them and so that they become from a second or third tier or level of leadership to the first level. And uh, that's something is still difficult, you know, there's, an, there's many, many excellent women in Yemen, and we usually have also the 30% quota of women in our meetings, but among the leadership of political parties and movements, the number of women in really decision-making function is very, very limited. It tends to be zero, actually, or very close to zero, so, so that's an issue we, we, we have to we are struggling with, I think we have found a way, but we could have done better had we started from the beginning to look into this issue. Uh, shukran, Dr. Thank Oliver. you very much, Oliver. Uh, if we could also hear about these challenges from Ali Saif, uh, if you can answer this question very briefly, we'll take some more questions from the attendees. You, you seem to be still muted, Ali. Can you hear me now? Yes. Adding to what my colleague and friend Oliver said, there are two types of challenges that we face. There are challenges that are related to the substance of what we're doing, and there are challenges related to the procedures. The challenges with the substance started from the very beginning of the dialogue that we were working on because of our insistence on discussing the issues that were at the core of the political conflict the pol and the political differences and to address these core issues and not just trying to resolve some of the tension to resolve the conflict over power among the elites in Sana'a. Many who worked in the field only focused on resolving the conflict over power that was occurring among the political elites in Sana'a, but our point of view was that it was very important to also resolve and deal with the real causes of the conflict, which were much older, like the wars in Sa'da, like the conflict in the South and all of the other conflicts in different parts of the country. And so our insistence to work on these very deep 
on, on these very in-depth issues was one of the biggest challenges that we faced in working with the political parties in the dialogue. And also our insistence on expanding and creating a safety network for these central level dialogues. The central level political elites, when they are in dialogue, they, they either ignore or do not care about or, or are far away from the issues that people face at the local level. People cannot bear all of this. You, you cannot take a year or two or three for dialogue and for discussions while people are in a state that is unbearable. State institutions are, are collapsing. Services are not being provided. Security, the security situation is only getting worse. And so it was very important for us to deal with this challenge by establishing the safety network for these dialogues through working at the local level, whether with the local authorities, primarily with the local authorities. We had an excellent experience in this in Damar. We unfortunately do not have any participants, but they have had excellent dialogues and we applaud their efforts there, as well as in Ta'iz and in Hadramaut and in Adan and different parts of the country. So we tried to expand it horizontally to ensure that this would be a safety net and will provide sufficient time for the dialogue occurring at the elite level. There's also the regional dimension, which was another challenge. And this was also related to the substance of the, of the discussions we were holding. And I thought, we, I think we were able to, to deal with it because uh, defining the war in Yemen as a civil war, I think shows a sh shortcoming in an understanding of the conflict. It's much more complex than that. There is a civil war dimension, but there's also a dimension of it being a regional conflict and not trying to resolve these two tracks or these two dimensions will lead to further difficulties in the future. And that is something that we have worked significantly on. Also working in a very fragmented political and social uh, at social levels. This fragmentation isn't just political. There's also geographic and social fragmentation and division in the country, but insisting that you continue to work and you continue to engage at the local level in different areas, in Sana'a, in Damar, in Ta'iz, in Adan, in Hadramaut, while continuing to travel and to go between these cities and cooperate and work with different political parties that are on opposing sides of the conflict, all of whom try to impose their own security, uh, their own security and political ideas, while you continue to try to float above all of this. If you're able to float above all of these local conflicts and disputes and differences and continue your work, then you'll be able to overcome these challenges. And I like seeing Oliver smile here. Thank you very much. Shukran, shukran, Amu Ali. Sonia. Thank you very much, Amu Ali. Uh, Sonia, uh, Sonia will take some questions from the attendees as well. Please go ahead, Sonia. Thanks a lot, Nadia. So we have filtered through uh, many of the questions that came in from, from the audience. Um, there is a few questions that link also back to, to what you have just been highlighting also, uh, Ali, about the, the cooperation with local authorities. So I would like to ask that question to Maeen, actually. In your experience in Thais, uh, what was your cooperation like with the local authorities? Have you been working with uh, social leaders, uh, influential figures, civil society in Thais? And, uh, and also what is your experience in coordination or cooperation with civil society organizations in Thais? Sorry. Uh, sorry, I forgot that my mic was muted. First, with regards to the work that we do in Thais, what I want to say is that the local authorities in Ta'iz are involved in the consultations that we conduct in the government. The, chief, the governor's chief of staff is one of the members of the consultations that we conduct in Ta'iz. And this has made our work with the local authorities progress along very smoothly. And there's a lot of cooperation between us. In addition to the fact that the governor of the local, the governor of Ta'iz, was someone who participated in a number of workshops and discussions that were adopted by the PDF and the Berga Foundation and meetings that were held outside of Yemen. And the current governor attended many of these meetings. And so he understood the work that we were trying to do. This made cooperating with the local authority, this gave the, the PDF 
and the Virgov Foundation's activities much more credible and it's made the local authorities much more cooperative. So for example, when we discuss any issues, when we discuss any of the issues that are of importance to the local communities, the, the problems that they face, when a decision is made during the consultations that we conduct, or whenever there is an output or an outcome from the meeting, we deliver them directly to the local authorities. Sometimes we make recommendations that the uh, that the heads of certain service provision offices need to be changed, and th there was a positive response. There were there were managers of some of these executive offices that, through the consultations, we found out that they were hindering the provision, for example, of water services or sanitation services, and they were they were replaced. And new managers have started to operate in these executive offices, and people have found that these consultations have led to a real difference on the ground. We, we try to work, we try to ensure that our work is not as seen or covered in the media. This is why sometimes uh, civilians might not see them, but some other civil society organizations have done things that was a result of the work that we started on, like the issue of water provision in Taiz, for example. We worked on a policy paper, a policy brief, that focused on the the issues facing water provision in Taiz. And as a result of these policy briefs was that some other organizations saw that this was an important issue. They tried to work on mediation, for example, mediating between the parties in Taiz city and those who are outside of Taiz city and in Khoban with Ansarullah. And so they have started to work on mediating on these issues. And this facilitated a change and now water is available in most of the areas that had not gotten water services since the beginning of the war. Also with regards to sanitation, for example, the head of the sanitation fund was replaced based on the recommendations of the Taiz consultations that we conducted. And so we analyzed the problem and recommended solutions and the governor attended the meeting. And whenever we find the need to meet with the governor to make recommendations, to propose outputs from our meeting, we find that they are very receptive, they are very cooperative, and we have we have done that. We've met with them and presented the results of our meetings, and we find that they're very responsive. And I thank the local authorities in Taiz for doing that, for being very responsive and for being very active. And this has been one of the factors that have helped us in our work inside the government. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Maine. Looking through the other questions, it refers back to also the question of how to avoid not only working with the political elite, but also being more inclusive in, in the dialogue work. Um, Ali Saif, I would like to, to turn to you with basically two questions that we uh, extracted from, from the chat and from the audience. The first question is how to make sure that the dialogue work is inclusive how to avoid that marginalized communities are always being uh, left out of, of dialogues, um, how to make sure that not only the very strong actors are part of, of negotiations and, and dialogues. So that's one question. And um, the, the second question, I will then ask you also to briefly reflect about what the political dialogue support program can do in the current situation and to try to support steps to build on the, on the current truths. These two questions to you, please. Yeah, Sonia, I will ask the Sabala Andy. I will understand you. Sonia, you're asking difficult questions. Why don't you give these difficult questions to others? And a, a, a local di dialogue, so there is a basic uh, uh, term that all, if each uh, com uh, local component will be, uh, will include all representation for all the localities in Taiz, in Lamar, in Hadramaut, in everywhere, uh, the political diversity, cultural and professional diversity, the marginalized groups are all represented. They are participants at the local level. But, but, the, 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 but the dialogue is, is objective is to end the conflicts and to end the war. And these political parties are, uh, uh, they, they are, they are, uh, 
uh, at the forefront of that. And, and it's a dialogue that enhances national dialogue that mitigates the impact of the fragmentation and includes many of the parties. There are parties that have not been particip participating maturely or maturely, but versus the STC, the STC in the South. Uh, uh, and it constituted a big problem until they, uh, they, 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 they started engaging the dialogues and have started the participant uh, participating and the, uh, the, the, uh, the conflict was reduced in Aden and other and elsewhere. We are, we, we are keen to have a, 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 a comprehensiveness politically and socially. Uh, and, and, and politically at the central level and uh, the, 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 the uh, com community community dialogues at the local level. Uh, the, the, the central level is to mitigate the impact of war or the truce uh, with, the, with the hope that we transition after that into addressing the issues that were the cause of war, the cause of fighting to the root causes of the war, which started prior to 2010 and prior to the Arab Spring, and it extended to the outskirts of Yemen. But at the local level, the objective was uh, to, to, uh, to maintain the governorate, to maintain the social fabric, to maintain service delivery and cohesiveness uh, at the social level, and uh, to maintain the minimum level uh, of uh, meeting the needs of the citizen. I hope that I have answered your question. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ali. I have a few more questions or or topics that came up in the in the comments and and in the chat, and um, I would like to ask you, Oliver, to address a few of them. They're again also difficult ones, um, so it's not always easy. One basically reflects on the experience shared between Yemen and Libya in relation to transitional justice, and the question to you would be if you could reflect a little bit on the difficulty of transitional justice in peace and dialogue processes. In addition to that, um, there is a question about our coordination with the UN Special Envoy's Office. So maybe you could say a few words about the mechanisms and ways of, of coordination and cooperation. And a third question also uh, about the role of Germany, given that Germany has been supporting this, this work of the PDF and the Worker Foundation since a long time, financially and politically, but also how do you see uh, the, the German role in terms of, do you think it's, it's likely that they continue the future support to Yemen, not necessarily to us as a program, but to Yemen uh, in, in terms of, of helping Yemenis trying to find a solution to, to, the, to the conflict? Over to you. I start with the most uh, tricky one is transitional justice. I'm not a transitional justice expert, nor does it have come up so often in our meetings. I mean, it is mentioned regularly, but it's not a, a major topic yet. But if you ask me personally, I cannot make a, a comparison with Libya, but if you ask me personally how important it is, I think it's very, very important. Um, so will it, will it be easy? Not at all. It will be very complicated. And we have seen uh, during the National Dialogue Conference, the, the Working Group on Transitional Justice, actually Ali was a member of that, of that working group, um, had, uh, had lots of problems. And also the UN, uh, which uh, in the beginning pushed and tried to support the passing of a transitional justice law, couldn't succeed. So it will be difficult to, to have a formal mechanism that does justice to all those very legitimate claims which are there. Because partly it is because there are so many now uh, claims, you know, for Southerners, of course, it is still the effects of the 94, what they would clearly describe as civil war and the expropriations and, 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 and loss of jobs and opportunities. For others, you know, it might go back to the 60s, So we have the a, a short bloody war in, in, in the South in 86, we have, what do else do we have? We have 2011, the, the, the uprising and, and uh, killing of quite a number of people. Uh, we have the war now, you know, and with all its different aspects. And I think lots of people who have very legitimate claims. So will it be important? 
definitely very important. Can it be fixed? I don't know how. I mean, I'm optimistic in a way, knowing, I mean, the Yemenis, I think, still have a very, as my experience, a very high capacity also to socially engage. D despite uh, political divides, I think on a social, personal level, there is an incredible uh, capacity, you know, to, to link up, to, to connect. And I think that might be helpful. But at the social level, you know, the fragmentation in the country will require that there is a very, you know, there's a deep discussion. There's a clear mechanism to ensure that, you know, there's probably no recurrence of violence in the near future so that people can really also come to terms with what has happened. But are Yemenis at all victors, victims? Yeah, they are. But of course, who is responsible for this? They're very different narratives. And to bridge these different narratives and to accept that in a way, you know, a way forward would require to coexist, to live together, that's still very, very difficult. So it's, you know, it, this would requires lots of additional thinking, but I think we are not there because partly, of course, in how far you can think about legal mechanism depends a bit on, on the, the shape of the political process and the the vision of the, you know, the emerging uh, system, and that's really too far away at the moment to, to, to then go into transitional justice aspects. The role of Germany is much easier to answer, and I'm not a German diplomat, but having worked closely with Germany and understanding a bit, uh, I think their self-understanding, you know, Germany has, has had a very long engagement with Yemen, uh, Germany, it's one of the biggest donors has always been is, is very strongly supporting the UN is a, a big provider to humanitarian assistance uh, has also clearly interest, especially in instability in the region because of trade as an export nation, you know, Bapu Mandap is a, is a very strategic location. So I would be surprised if Germany wouldn't continue, but Germany would probably not step up a lot of its it's direct uh, political engagement, but it would be very supportive to a peace process if there is one. So uh, in case of a peace process, I, I, I'm pretty sure Germany will continue support with the EU, also based on the perception that Germany is being, considers itself and is being seen by many Yemenis as pretty neutral in the, in the conflict. So I think there's good reason to assume that Germany will stay engaged. But if there is no peace process, also it will, of course, the pressure will be high to reduce uh, levels of spending and, and the amount of attention. That's also clear. Um, coordination with the UN on a very technical level, of course, you know, very technically, we had different models of very close real collaboration on, you know, agreeing on topics for workshops and, and, and looking into a list of participants for a while. But that's not always the case, but minimum in, in all our dialogue meetings outside and inside uh, Yemen, UN participates as observers. So we are in, in constant touch with the office, uh, but also with the envoy himself, you know, to discuss strategic questions. We have been involved in, in joint strategizing with the with different envoys actually. So there, there is, I mean, there are mechanisms of coordination. The UN plays a role of coordination, but that's very loosely. So it's mostly direct uh, related to activities and involvement of UN staff in our, in our activities. Okay, thank you so much uh, for answering all these questions. We have many more questions, but we're running out of time. So I'm handing back to you, Nadia. Uh, of course, we have no sufficient time, but uh, the Arabic questions and the English questions, there are many indications that you can find in the Berkala Foundation website and also the uh, PDF website. There are many questions and they are relevant, uh, but you can visit both uh, websites to find the answers to your questions. At the end of the 10th anniversary celebration, 
cooperation uh, uh, of the cooperation between PDDF and Bergamo Foundation. I would like to thank everyone. I would like to thank uh, Oliver Wills, the head of the MENA department in Bergamo Foundation, Mr. Ali Saif Hassan, the executive director of PDF, and the coordinator of PDF uh, and Bergamo Foundation in Ta'az, my dear, I mean, Ma'in Al Abidi, and my colleague, and my, my dear colleague Sonia. I would also would like to thank everyone who, part, who participated and those who have asked a question and even those who have, whom we have not been able to answer the question because we are committed to maintain the time for the celebration. I would like to thank you very much and I hope to see you again in the next uh, in the next uh, 10 year anniversary or uh, uh, while after we have already achieved many things and I wish you uh, good